Hi class, it's me. Um, I'm recording this lecture a little bit on diabetes type 1. I'm hoping that in on Tuesday we get to this point in lecture. I think we will. If not, I'll catch us up next week. So please watch it. You may see quiz questions. Okay, thanks guys. I'm going to get rid of my face and start talking. Okay. So we talked a little bit about an intro to type 1 diabetes and some of the things that can happen with type 1 diabetes based on the lack of insulin. So as insulin levels decline or are completely eliminated due to beta cell death, the body starts relying on NEFA for fuel, which NEFA is non-essential fatty acids. Um, and we can use non-essential fatty acids because we don't need insulin to use them. This is good because it's glucose sparing and any glucose that we do have can be utilized for metabolism. Also, we can't get glucose into our cells, the majority of the cells, at least on muscle, et cetera, without insulin. The problem is the longer we utilize our fatty acids, um, more and more of them will be converted to ketone bodies. And it's good because this allows us to survive a long time. The brain can use the ketone bodies. However, the ketone bodies will build up and they are acidic and that can lead to ketosis or diabetic ketoacidosis, which the ketosis in diabetes is much, much, much more severe than like in a ketogenic diet. And that's because of a lack of insulin or very minuscule amount of insulin. In people who aren't diabetic, they won't have as severe of a ketosis because they have a little bit of insulin, even if they're not eating carbs, and that insulin lets them put um, lets them use glucose as a fuel source. But without insulin, we can't use glucose as a fuel. So the three ketone bodies that are produced are beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. And beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate stay within the blood. Acetone is actually volatile, and so we breathe this via our breath. And um, it can cause kind of a fruity odor. And so some of the diabetic dogs are trained to sniff this out. Okay, next slide. All right, so this is a little bit of a review, but more in depth of what I just said. So as the blood becomes acidic, the body needs to balance acid-base balance. You guys hopefully remember this. This should be a review from one of your acid-base slides. Um, in order to ba balance acid base, it needs to get rid of the ketones. And with the excretion of the ketones, sodium, potassium are also lost in the urine because sodium follows water and you need a lot of water to pee out these ketones. These also compensate for more acidity in the blood. The blood, however, is still very acidic because the amount of ketones produced in diabetic ketoacidosis is so high that it goes to one of our other mechanisms to adjust pH, which is excreting CO2. And the way we excrete CO2 is via our breath. So we're trying to breathe out CO2, but the breathing becomes difficult and labored. We do have bicarbonate as part of our acid-base buffer system. However, our levels of bicarbonate will quickly become depleted with the such high levels of acid. And so eventually we don't have enough bicarbonate and the bicarbonate isn't available to neutralize what's being created in the urine and the urine pH drops to be excessively acidic. And at the point where the urine is so acidic, Hydrogen can't be excreted in the urine, and so hydrogen is just circulating in the blood, causing the pH of the blood to become dangerously acidic. This low pH of the blood can lead to nausea, vomiting, which is late stage. If somebody's vomiting, the decay is already very severe, coma, and death, which is equally late stage and severe. So some of the symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis Polyuria is um, excessive, uh, polyuria, lots of pee, thirst, um, excessive thirst, dry mouth, increased urine, hunger, polydipsia, 
weakness, anorexia, et cetera. And these are some of the causes of each symptom. Diabetic ketoacidosis is always dangerous, but it's especially dangerous if it happens while somebody is sleeping. Okay, outcomes and treatment. So young children are the ones most frequently admitted to the hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis. And although this particular graph looks like they have the least or the lowest mortality rate for those under 30 of diabetic ketoacidosis, one study that I was looking into was actually saying that they think this is underdiagnosed and more underdiagnosed the younger people get. Um, anyways, diabetic ketoacidosis only uh, results in about 2 to 5% of deaths, but if you look at elderly over 70, they have 15% mortality from diabetic ketoacidosis. And one of the ways we would treat it is we would give IV fluids so that the kidney can continue to excrete those. We would give insulin so that the body can use glucose for fuel and no longer has to rely on essential or non-essential fatty acids. And we would give electrolytes to replace those that are lost and those who have shifted from intracellular to extracellular or vice versa. Honeymoon phase. So, um, Often after somebody is diagnosed, there is a period called the honeymoon phase. And this period is kind of a transient restoration of the beta cell function. And it usually happens after this patient has started insulin therapy. So maybe they've been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Maybe they're in the hospital for DKA. Now they're going to start insulin therapy. Um, they're probably going to need a lot of insulin initially. But as this goes on for a couple of weeks, they may actually find they need less and less insulin. And it's almost this like rebound of the beta cells. Um, yeah, so, so they'll still need insulin, but they might not require that much and they might not be 100% insulin dependent. Maybe they'll just need a long acting insulin, et cetera. Some people don't even need insulin for a while. Um, Honeymoon phase, it's usually between one month or one month and 12 months. Um, but some studies have shown this to happen up to 13 years, which is very, very, very rare. Um, it's more likely to be longer in a child or adult who was diagnosed versus a um infant so versus zero to five it's more likely to be longer in say like five to twelve or even in adults and that's because the type of type 1 diabetes that's diagnosed in infants is often much fiercer as far as autoimmune destruction and so when infants get diagnosed usually they have a much larger portion of their beta cells destroyed versus younger children or adults um, the reason the diabetes honeymoon phase is important is because not all the beta cells have died off and it might represent a really important window of opportunity to restore some of that beta cell function or preserve it. And so some of the potential drugs and therapies that they use for that include metformin, um, berberine, maybe a low carb diet, um, and some different types of TZDs or GLP-1, which we're going to talk about more coming up. So it could be this really big window of opportunity to prevent further beta cell decline. Monitoring. So self-management blood glucose monitoring. Um, this is daily home glucose monitoring and you prick your finger and you take that little droplet of blood, you put it into a little test strip, the test strip goes into the meter and it will give you a readout of your blood level. Usually these meters have memory so they can remember the blood levels over time and they can be uploaded to a phone or a computer. Um, in the olden days, this, has to, this had to all be written down. So, you should do this at least four or more times a day. However, um, your insurance might only pay for four times a day. 
it would be better to probably do this six or seven times a day or even more frequently. But the more you do this, kind of the more painful this gets, the more supplies you use, etc. And the test strips are relatively expensive. They can be anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar, something each. So if you're going through eight of them a day and you're doing this for your entire life, that could really add up. So um, a possible schedule of how you might prick your fingers, and I'm gonna kind of tell you about this, is fasting. So first thing in the morning, you want to wake up and check your blood glucose. For newly diagnosed diabetics, they may actually have to wake up at 3 a.m. just to make sure they're not dropping too low in the middle of the night. And a fasting blood sugar to, should be between 70 to 130 um, milligrams per deciliter. So first thing in the morning, they should check. They should also check before meals. So if they're eating three meals a day, they would be checking three times before meals and they should check after meals, two hours after meals. So they would be checking once before each meal, once after each meal. If there's three meals a day, that's six additional times, plus the fasting one in the morning, plus at bedtime. And then I did mention that middle of the night check that they may or may not do. So we're having six, seven, eight, even nine times that would be ideal to prick prick your fingers. Um, however, most people aren't able to do this. They may be able to do this a little bit in the beginning of the diagnosis, but not throughout. Other things, continuous glucose monitoring. This is going to be through a glucose monitor meter that is attached to your body via a small needle. It usually needs to be rotated every two to three days or three to four days. Um, Hemoglobin A1C, we usually do this every quarter or four times a year or every three months. And um, our goal for this is seven or less. It might not be the most ideal tool, but we can still use it. And then urine levels of blood glucose and ketones. So if you check your blood glucose and it's over 250, that represents the renal threshold, which makes it difficult for your kidneys to excrete it. And so you should check your urine to see if glucose is spilling into your urine, at which time you would definitely need more insulin. Also, if you're sick, if you've had, um, if you're newly diagnosed, you may also want to check the urine levels of blood glucose and ketones. So if you're sick, if you're newly diagnosed, or if your blood sugar is very high over 250, you may want to check your ketones. Oh, I forgot to say how high the blood sugar should be after the meals. So generally you would check two hours after, this would be considered postprandial, and you want your blood sugar to be less than 180. Okay, so just like I said, check when they wake up, before meals, two hours after meals, at bedtime, middle of the night, when you're high, low, or sick. Okay, um, what people may find when they check their fasting blood sugar in the morning? There are two kind of different effects. One of them is called the Somiyaji effect, the other one is called the Dawn phenomenon. So the Somiyaji effect is shown on the left chart. They're actually both on the left chart, but the Somiyaji effect is green. And so what happens with the Somiyaji effect is your blood sugar is low during the night. And this could happen if you missed your dinner, you, um, I don't know, took too many meds, your body made more glucose, et cetera. And so when your blood sugar falls low in the night, your body responds by trying to make more glucose. And so it kind of rebounds your blood glucose from being too low to now too high. And so you'll wake up too high. And that's a result. It's called rebound hyperglycemia. So sometimes people think, oh, if I don't eat dinner, that will be good because my blood sugar won't be too high in the morning. But actually, if they skip dinner, their blood sugar is more likely to be high than it is normal or low. So we don't generally recommend skipping dinner or an evening meal. The second thing is called the dawn phenomenon. And during the nighttime, 
generally we have spikes in two uh, antagonistic hormones, cortisol and growth hormone. And so what these two hormones do is they cause a high blood sugar. However, um, for people without diabetes, they will release insulin to counteract this high blood sugar and they won't wake up with morning hyperglycemia. But for people with diabetes, they don't have insulin to react to this high blood sugar that's a result of these two hormones. And so they wake up in the morning and their blood sugar is high. So high morning blood sugar can be explained by two different effects, the dawn phenomenon and the somiagi effect. Okay, so type one treatment. So obviously we want to maintain blood sugar in a normal range. We wanna lower the risk of complications, which we're gonna talk about coming up. Avoid hyper and hypoglycemia, normal growth and development. This picture is from um, the internet, but it's a family where all three of their children have type 1 diabetes. And you can see on their arms, their midarm, this is the continuous blood glucose monitor. So that's monitoring their blood glucose 24 hours a day. Um, it has to be a team effort. So we would involve the doctor, the dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, maybe a nurse practitioner uh, or a nurse, a um, physician's assistant, a pharmacist, maybe a mental health specialist, et cetera. And it can include exogenous insulin. Exogenous means other than what the body creates on its own. It's like from the outside, nutrition and exercise, both recommendations, but also cautions with exercise. Okay, so types of insulin. Um, insulin that we have available to us on the market is meant to mimic our physiological, like what we would make if our beta cells were making it. And generally it's considered recombinant human insulin. It's a genetically modified uh, amino acid structure. And they have actually genetically modified this and tweaked it different ways to get different pharmacokinetics. So certain types of insulin will last longer than others. Um, we used to get insulin from pigs pancreases and we used to get insulin from dog pancreases. So they would have to grind up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pink pancreases and dog pancreases to produce the, the insulin. And that's literally what you would use. The dose is based on body weight and your blood glucose levels. It also could be affected by age, your insulin sensitivity, your activity level, and your liver function. Okay, this is just a very big list of different types of insulins out there and the brand name and kind of the manufacturer, the um, action of them, the onset, that means how quickly does it start to work? The peak effect is when is its maximum effort? And then the duration is how long it lasts. You can see these all have different timings for them. And so you would pick one based on your individualized need. Rapid acting, um, acting insulins are often used when blood sugar is high, um, before meal, et cetera. Uh, short acting insulin could be used with meals. And then intermediate or long-term are usually used once or twice a day. And then there are some mixed insulins that are supposed to cover both. I will not ask you the names of these different insulins, but you should know that there are different types based on how long they act and the onset. So this is a diagram showing kind of how these types react and what their peaks are and how quickly they react. So the red one is rapid acting insulin and then in parentheses are some of the brand names. And so rapid acting insulin works the fastest. It has the highest peak and one of the shortest durations. Um, and right around two and a half hours, the activity of it pretty significantly declines. Then there's short acting in orange, intermediate acting can last about 15 hours, long acting, um, detrimere, that's one type of long acting, 16 hours, and then long glargine. Glargine is usually uh, lantus or something like that. 
And um, Detamir is Levamir, but, but Glargine is Lantus. Lantus is one of the most common long acting insulins used. And sometimes people only have to take it once a day. Sometimes people take it twice a day, but Lantus is the most common type of long acting insulin used. Okay. So how do we figure out the doses? I did just mention some of the things that we look into, um, but we look at the individual person. And so we can look at their body weight. Generally, we would multiply their weight in kilos by 0.55, or we would divide their weight in pounds by four. So for example, this person weighs 140 pounds. And if you divide 140 pounds by four, you get 35 units of insulin. And so I won't ask you this complicated of what I'm gonna tell you next, but what you would do with that 35 units, that's for the day, so you would use 17 and a half of it as their basal insulin and 17 and a half of it to distribute over their bolus insulins. But I could ask you, you know, how to calculate baseline insulin based on weight. So you can do weight in pounds divided by four, and that's the number of units of insulin in theory you would start with. You obviously would monitor to make sure this is the appropriate dose. Insulin regimen. So you can have fixed insulin regimen where you never change your insulin, flexible or continuous infusion. And I think we can watch this video that's pretty good. Um, if I can find it. Video, where are you? Hmm. Well, this is the website for Novalog, and I thought it had a video, but I guess that it did not, which is okay, we'll survive. Um, so let's go back here. Um, I might have to find that in class. Okay, anyways. Um, so this pattern shown in the yellow is a very, very, very typical pattern that somebody would use. And so the blue represents their long acting insulin, like for example, their Lantus. And then these red humps represent their short acting insulin. Um, so they would give themselves short acting bolus of insulin before a meal. That insulin would cover them during the meal. And then they would give them another bolus before lunch and another bolus before dinner, all the meanwhile that the long acting insulin is keeping their blood sugar pretty stable. So this is a traditional basal bolus insulin regimen, and you definitely would want to know that. Okay, so fixed plans. So a fixed plan would include a dose of basal insulin, usually two ejections a day, kind of like what I just showed you, plus standard mealtime dose of rapid or short acting insulin, so bolus. In, so with this fixed plan, they can't change how much bolus or basal they give themselves based on meals. So they're always giving themselves the same basal and the same bolus every meal. Um, and so for this particular plan, it makes it really important that they eat the exact amount of carbs each time, otherwise the insulin that they're prescribed might not be enough to cover them, or it could be too much to cover them. So with this, it's important that they don't skip any meals and they eat a consistent amount of carbs. Um, so yeah, they use premixed insulin. This is good for beginners because it's simple to understand. You just say, okay, every single meal, 10 units of insulin. Every morning, 10 units of Lantus. Every night, 10 units of Lantus and they don't have to think that much. The only thing is though, they have to really focus on their carb intake, their activity level. If they exercise too much, we're gonna talk about, um, it can affect blood glucose. They can't skip meals. They should take this at the same time every day, et cetera. So this would be a fixed insulin plan, often called a basal bolus plan. Flexible insulin plans. 
So um, this looks similar. However, you notice that the peaks in the red, which is the short acting insulin, are different heights. So with a flexible plan, you are using multiple injections a day, but you can adjust how much bolt uh, basal insulin you give depending on what you eat. And if you didn't eat something, you wouldn't have to give yourself an injection of bolus insulin. Um, this is important for patient motivation. Patients need to be aware of how to read labels, portion sizes, insulin action, and they need to be um, testing their blood sugar multiple times a day. Um, they can adjust insulin to treat higher or low blood sugar or carb intake changes, exercise, etc. And a lot of people will use the insulin pens to give these. So they can twist the very end of the pen and it will give them a different amount of insulin and then they can inject it via the pen. Um, so this would be a flexible insulin plan where you primarily are changing the bolus levels at each meal. Okay. Um, okay, so CSII, this is continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. And so this is similar to flexible, but instead of you actually giving yourself an insulin injection five to seven times a day, a pump is going to do it for you. And you can program the pump to do it. Some of the pumps automatically read your own blood sugar and are starting to be able to base the injection of insulin off of that, but that's kind of newer technology. And so during the day, there the pump is giving you a small, small amount of um, basal insulin. And this is really nice because the pump can give you as small of an amount of basal insulin as 0 0.001 units. So that's kind of what a normal pancreas would do is give you a very small amount all day long. And so that's what this pump can do. Where if you're using a needle to give yourself basal, you're going to give yourself uh, a long amount. And so you could look at your meal and see what you're going to eat. And then you could adjust your pump so that your pump gives you um, rapid acting or bolus insulin. And um, you would do that before meals. Um, the rate can be changed based on insulin sensitivity, sleep, and activity. So this is a um, video from Medtronic. And they are a company that sells it, but it's worth watching. Sherry Ellison, who teaches at Cal Poly, is a Medtronic rep, and she actually has a Medtronic pump in her office and has taught students how to really get the best students out there. So if you're interested in this, you can talk to Sherry. Most of the machines will alarm if you fall into a low blood glucose level, and they'll also stop the insulin infusion so um, that your blood glucose doesn't get any lower. Okay. I think that that's Oh, this is showing a USB device. So you can upload your data into the computer. You could send it to your doctor. You could analyze it yourself, etc. So, 
Okay, so insulin pump, some pros and cons. Um, some of the pros are you do get better, better glycemic control. And so this little diagram on the right is showing the continuous glucose monitor and how it catches all of your highs and lows, where if you're only pricking your finger these five times a day, you might happen to prick your finger when your blood glucose is relatively normal and you could miss some of these highs and lows. And it's this variation from very high to very low that actually can lead to most of the long-term complications of diabetes. With the continuous blood glucose monitor, you're monitoring it nonstop. The good thing is this is in your body for multiple days, so you're not having to prick yourself you know, six, seven, eight times a day. You do rotate the site usually every three days. Um, it acts closer to your pancreas because of the low levels of basal insulin it can secrete. And um, it's more flexible for meal times, travel, et cetera. There's lower risk of hypoglycemia because it does have those alarms and it will stop insulin injection if it sees that your blood sugar is low and lower hospitalization rates. Um, it's generally good for anybody who's willing to learn, but a lot of adolescents, athletes, um, pregnant women, et cetera, like it and uncontrolled diabetes like it as well. Some of the cons, mechanical malfunction, um, kinking or blocking of the infusion set. You could run out of batteries. It does alarm, but there's a freak chance you could. Um, too bulky. People don't like the way it looks. Um, you can disconnect it from your entry port if you swim or shower, but the entry ports stay on you. So, yeah. Okay, side effects. So um, side effects include hypoglycemia. This would generally happen if you give yourself too much insulin or if you've given yourself insulin and not eaten a meal. Um, weight gain, insulin is anabolic hormone. Lipohypertrophy at site of injection. Lipohypertrophy is a lump under the skin. You can see these lumps on this guy's thighs on the far right. And um, it's caused by increased fat cell production. It can be raised because insulin is, is anabolic, so it's causing more fat cell production. It may change the way insulin is dispersed. It's unslightly and slightly painful. And so there's different patterns you can use to prick yourself, which are shown on these bellies. And then there's also on the far left these um, temporary tattoos that you can use to put on your body. And so each time you give yourself an insulin injection, you scrub off that little tattoo and you don't use that site again for quite a while. Um, okay, signs and symptoms of low blood sugar. These signs and symptoms usually occur at 70 or less, but they could occur a lot lower than that. People might feel fine at 70, just depends on the person. Um, usually the symptoms develop quickly, but some people don't experience any symptoms. If it's really severe, they won't be able to recognize the symptoms and they'll need help from another person. So you definitely would want to know some of the symptoms. And tiny bit more, hypoglycemia. So I talked a little bit about this, but um, this could be due to not enough carb, too much insulin, too much exercise. Exercise is a little bit complicated because it depends on the type that you do. If you're doing kind of mild exercise, walking, maybe riding a bike, you will probably result in hypoglycemia. If you're doing intense exercise, you're doing CrossFit or you're running a race or you have a lot of epinephrine that's released, that's actually going to cause high blood sugar. Um, but as you finish doing that exercise, your epinephrine will decrease. And if you have already treated that high blood sugar by taking insulin, your blood can actually drop. So post-exercise, your blood sugar can drop for up to 24 hours. So people need to be really careful reacting to high blood sugars caused by exercise because almost all of those high blood sugars will rebound into low blood sugars. And there's actually been some unfortunate cases of athletes that have died in their sleep because they treated a high blood sugar, um, they went to sleep, and then over the night, their blood sugar continued to drop and they fell out of consciousness. So exercise, you have to be really careful about. Um, things to recommend. So don't skip, don't delay meals, don't consume alcohol, um, especially don't consume alcohol with 
without carbs, using the least amount of insulin possible might be good. Um, have things available to treat hypoglycemia, like a half of a cup of fruit juice, soda, honey. They have glucose tabs that you can take. Um, there's This is a glucose gel that you can rub in your lips. Some people have told me they use flat out frosting. And so those could all be a good idea. Hyperglycemia. So um, these are generally caused by the opposite. So too little insulin, overeating, infections, trauma, stress, and illness. When you have an infection, you have a lot of counter-regulatory hormones like cortisol and epinephrine that drive up blood sugar. Um, even people who don't have diabetes may develop hyperglycemia during stress or illness. And illness may cause hyperglycemia even days before it develops. So sometimes people with diabetes will notice their blood sugar getting high. And then a few days later, they'll actually have, um, they'll get a cold or something. Sick day recommendations. This is part of what you would generally educate somebody on, especially a newly di di diabetic. So you have to check your blood sugar, even if you're not eating every two to three hours, you take your insulin, even when you're not eating, because you're your glucose will be naturally high due to these counter-regulatory hormones. Um, you need to try to have carbs. If you don't feel well, maybe you can drink some carbs. And you need to check urine ketone levels because you could be spilling, spilling ketones into the urine. All right, so no sick day requirements, and that's it. Thank you, guys.